I am the original team Not about drama, let's get ourselves free I am the original team I'll tell you some stories, we'll look for that key I am the original team Let's talk about life, it's as fast as the sea I am the original team Let's all find a path, we'll live it And let it be Hi again. It's me. It's T. I know. I've been MIA. I know. <laughs> it's more than MIA, isn't it? Whatever that is. But I'm back um, and doing things a little bit differently now. Have some focused areas I want to go to. And so I'm going to kind of chunk up this channel a little bit. And I want to talk about being an end-of-life doula. I'm going to claim that now, and I surely can. Um, I want to talk about being a funeral celebrant or an officiant, somebody who does the eulogies at the funerals, funeral arranger. And then I also still want to do my just tea talks, which those are the ramblers, aren't they? <laughs> we just kind of talk back and forth. But today I want to talk about being an end of life doula. And have you heard of that phrase yet? End of life doula. Now I know I've done other videos, but I'm probably going to scrap some of those and just start fresh. Because I want to make sure people understand what it is and um, what we do. And because it is kind of a strange name, doula, isn't that the person who helps with babies? Well, end of life doula helps walk you home. And I say, we're all just walking each other home. That is a quote from Ram Dass, who has already walked home. And I'm sure he was walked home with many friends. Um, an end of life doula does something similar and to be technical and and some not technical as well let me just give you kind of a rundown of what an end of life doula could do and does do um, and what we don't do first of all we're not doctors we're not nurses we're not medical people we're not carers uh, we don't administer injections and all of that kinds of things um, we have district nurses. Now remember, I sound American. That's because I was born in America. I live in the UK now, so I'm a dual citizen. I've been here for 14 years, so I work in the UK. So I follow the UK, England's rules on what an end-of-life doula does. So keep that in mind when I'm talking because you've got some of the other folks out and about um you've got some lovely folks who are hospice workers uh like julie who i love um and she's written a book i'll have to get like a list of the name of her book if she's got more than one or of the one um and i'll put it on my page because i just i love watching her videos and i think she's in california which is where i'm from and i just get her i totally get her and she kind of inspired me to come back here and, and retake this end of life doula stuff again. And um, so that's what I'm going to do. So again, not a doctor, not a nurse, not a carer in, in, in that way, not in a medical way. Instead, say that you know that you have a life limiting illness or cancer or something that you know that you are not going to be living for a very long time. Maybe the last of your days are upon you or last months, last years, or even maybe you don't have anything wrong with you, but you want to plan. You want to plan what the end looks like for you. And you want it to be a certain way. You want your wishes to be 
held, right? You want somebody to know what your wishes are and you want your damn wishes to be kept, okay? An end of life doula can help you do that. Um, so one of the things we do, and again, England, UK, we use what's called an ADRT, which is an advanced decision. It used to be called an advanced directive, but now it's an advanced decision. And in that is a legal binding document that is signed by you. It is witnessed by many people. It is looked at by your GP, also known as a doctor in the States. Uh, it could be looked at by your oncology team. It could be looked at by anybody who's taking care of you medically, your hospital. Uh, but there will be a copy with you. There will be a copy with me. There will be a copy where it's easy to find with your GP and with your team if you have one. And it will be uh, signed and it will say what you want in the end. So, and these are things like, do I want to die at the hospital? Do I want to die in a hospice? Do I want to die at home? Do I want my bed by the garden window so I can look out the window? Do I want my room set up on the bottom floor so it's easier to get to the toilet, AKA bathroom, um, you know, easier to move around? What about, um, what kind of music do I want? What kind of people do I want around me? Now this gets to be a bit tricky. Some people have loved ones, lots and lots of loved ones and friends, and maybe they've already talked about it and they know what they're gonna do. Other people may have lots of loved ones, but they haven't talked about it and it's not something they talk about, it's just not the done thing between them. And some, they just don't feel comfortable about it and they want kind of a spare third party who's not involved in their daily life to help them work things out. Um, because it just makes them feel more comfortable and it, what it does is it enables it enables that person to put their loved ones back in their rightful positions of, of maybe daughters and sons, husbands, wives, friends, you know, instead of carers or people who are worried about that your wishes are being kept. You know, there's somebody like me that knows. Um, and to give you an example, I'm going to give you a basic example of my most recent experience. Um, so that you can understand what I did in that case. And there's lots and lots and lots of different cases here, right? Um, but let's just start with knowing that there was somebody out there who was interested in an end of life doula. They knew that they had a limited amount of time. They knew that they really didn't want their children to carry that load of going through all the technicalities of the ADRT and do not resuscitate and all that kind of stuff, right? So this person didn't want to be kept alive by artificial means. Um, they wanted to have their doula with them when they passed. Um, they wanted their family to be around before they got to the point where maybe they were sleeping a lot or they were not coherent any longer, or if it was a loved one, maybe they wanted them to come when they were really, really passing um, to just come snuggle up in bed with them. And some just wanted to say goodbye while they still could. And then I was there at the very end and that's, that's how it went this time round. Uh, my experience here in the UK. And this person, had me take a look at their ADRT. We went through it. I had a mentor. We always end of life doulas work with mentors. We do at end of life doula UK work with mentors um, because you can imagine the emotional load that you may feel and it's good to have somebody and, and I had somebody really fantastic. Um, amazing and strong and really helpful and just 
told me, you know, because I needed to know how it was, what their opinion was. I needed the information fast <laughs> and it didn't have to be fancy. So we decided that I would go ahead and be the doula for this person. And um, we completed the ADRT and we made sure that a copy was left everywhere it needs to be left. And you can look that up and learn about that yourself. Some people like to go ahead and do their ADRT and some people don't. <laughs> and it's completely up to you what you do. You know, it's like wills and probate and ADRTs and uh, executors. These are all things that save your family a lot of trouble and sadness and emotion and hurt feelings when you go, if you get them all laid out beforehand. So it's one way to save everybody that way, if you can. And not everybody can, and that's perfectly okay. We're all different, aren't we? So we got that all done and we had a copy everywhere we needed it. We let this person had carers already in to see them and help them with their daily care. Um, we met the district nurses, I did. Um, I spoke with the GP on the phone and got to know him and explained what I was <laughs> because even here, um, not all GPs know exactly who we are and what we do. We're still kind of new in the scheme of things. Um, and so we're just popping up all over the place. Um, we even run what's called a death cafe. Have you heard of those? Um, they're death cafes and you can go and have a cup of coffee or tea and some snack and meet with people and talk about end of life and, and things like that in a really casual place. Maybe it's a bookstore where you're having coffee and, and talking about these things, but it's, it's a way of getting rid of the mystery, you know, because we, we have tended to put death and dying back to the Victorian days in many ways, um, by hiding it. And what we're trying to do now is bring it back to the open. Like it was, believe it or not, in the olden days, because remember, we used to live with each other back in the olden days. We'd live with our grandmothers, grandfathers, great grandmothers, great grandfathers, people, babies were born. Uh, the older folks died in that same house, oftentimes, and children were there to see it, all of any age. Um, and the older people were there to see the babies be born. And so it was just part of life and it is just part of life. And over time, I think we um, we brought some creep factor to it, didn't we? <laughs> I still blame it on the Victorian days. So I do think it's, I love the Victorians. I think they're great. They're a bit crazy, but they are very fascinating anyway. Um, but it's time to bring things back out into the open again, um, because we got here, right? We were born, we gon' go. <laughs> so wherever you believe, don't believe, doesn't matter. We got here, we're gonna go. And um, and that's that's why we're here. We're here to make sure that last part is covered for you. Um, and we sit down and we work with you. We go through a checklist of who are you? What do you like? What don't you like? What do you believe in? What don't you believe in? What are some experiences you've had? What kind do you want to stay away from? Oh, what about all the way down to what are your favorite flavors, right? Because think about this Think You get to the point where you're feeling really not well and you've got a mouthwash and somebody's using like peppermint and you hate peppermint and you really rather have something that tastes like cinnamon or you loathe the smell of lilac um, but you love rose um, little tiny things like that can bring you so much comfort when you're in your bed or sitting on your sofa whatever at the end of your life um, so you you go down and you think of things like that and are you a touchy-feely person would you like to be held 
Would you like your hair brushed? Would you like your hands massaged? Would you like your back rubbed? Would you want your partner to do that? Who do you want to visit? Who are we not having visit? Can we do Zoom? Um, do you have any, any things where you might need some help, some extra help? Maybe you need an iPad. Maybe you need um, some of the cooler, newer gadgets that track your eye movements. Maybe you're to the point where you can't speak, um, but you still want to communicate. Um, we can help go out there and find what, what's out there for you and try to get it for you. Um, we're quite industrious that way. So you can send us out. We'll, we'll come in and do your laundry for you if you want. <laughs> Clean the bathroom. Come sit, talk to you, make you a cuppa, whatever it is. But at the end of the day, what we want to do is make sure that your wishes are upheld and that you have the death that you want to have. And if that means that you'd like to have us with you, then we plan that and we talk about it. What would you like? Would you like us to be sitting with you? Do you like the feel of cold flannels or washcloths on your forehead? Special music, what about playlists? What about favorite foods and drinks? Um, it just depends, you know, it depends on what's ailing you as to what you might be able to consume or not consume, consumables, anything that is within the law and that we can do to help you feel better. And on top of that, we have your list. We have your list of district nurses, hospice team, your oncology team, um, your GP. So we also have what's called, we have dibs, we know where it is. It's called a just in case box. And anyone who has uh, a life limiting illness and they know that they're coming down to months or a last year will be given through the NHS here in the UK a box that contains medicine that will help you feel comfortable or will hydrate you may help with anxiety um, cramping just things that may go along with things as you face the end of life that our bodies just do and one of the big deals for the end of life doulas is that similar to your hospice team is we want to make sure that pain is not an issue. So we're always going to look, we're going to be watching you. We've learned through time and study in depth study to look for signs of your discomfort. Even if you can't speak, we will watch and we will know and we will know what to do and who to call. And we will make sure that you have the most peaceful and beautiful passing and death that you can have. And that's what I did with this person who I walked home. And I ended up staying there for three weeks. Oftentimes we do as we'll go stay when it gets to be towards the end um, to support the family as they may be coming through and um, to make sure that people aren't coming to the house that don't need to be there. So sometimes we'll put a sign out um, just saying, do not disturb or leave a message because, you know, anybody could be banging on that door and it could be a really critical time for you where you need peace. And um, so we're just kind of making sure that you've got what you want. If you want your family to be surrounding you, then we'll help that and we'll stay out of your way. We'll get your family to you and we'll just be around in, in the ethers there, making sure it's, it's like we're there, but we're not there. That's what I like to say in those cases where you just kind of want your family with you. I'll make sure that things are okay for you. And I'm also there. I've been educated to be able to help with bereavement and to talk with your family and your children, friends, uh, to explain anything that I can, any changes that may be happening with you, what to expect, um, if they want to be kept in contact, if you want me to keep in contact with them, I will. If you want me to make a WhatsApp for your family, I will. Sometimes your family already has one, a lot of times they will. 
Sometimes they'll have me join it just so I can give updates. I did in this case, just give updates and say cares have come and gone. We're having a peaceful evening here. We're watching the telly. We're watching fun things about dogs. <laughs> in time, as time went by and as as the illness grew and, and this loved one that I was taking care of, um, they were quieter. Um, they slept more. Um, in the beginning, they were more talkative, so I got to know about their life. And I took notes. I took lots of notes. I took lots and lots and lots of notes. I typed furiously when it was time for me to go to bed. And I got sent to bed sometimes by this person. Um, and I am keeping anonymous um, because that's the way it is. And... Um, Sometimes they say, all right, T, it's time for you to go to bed. I'm like, okay, I'm almost 59 and I'm getting sent to bed. I cannot say no to that. <laughs> Thank you. Ultimately, I knew that I'd be sitting in, in uh, a recliner chair next to this person as they got to their last days. I'd stay in the same room with them um, to comfort them and to watch and to walk them home. Um and, and to do all the things that we talked about. I had my fake candles <laughs> um, that turn beautiful lights. I had these little unicorns, little plastic unicorns. And um, what else did I have? A Pegasus um, that changed rainbow colors. And this person, they were, they were incredibly in intellectual, so studied, so, so smart. I was so impressed by all their education and their strength, strong person. But as the days ticked down and this person lost some of their words, maybe some of their memories, I'd bring out those little things with the rainbow colors. I'd put them up on the windowsill and that person would just look at them and be like, It's like that raw part of them, that that magical part of them. It, I'll be, I will miss a bit because you know I'm like that. Um, but they saw that, and it was just beauty, beauty. You know, they saw beauty, and and they loved it. And so I remembered things like that. And so I would come and sit by their bed and speak with them. And, and talk to them about some of the really precious memories they had. And every day and every night before bed, I would say the names of their family members, each and every name that I'd been asked to say. And I even took voicemails. I asked some of the family to leave me a voicemail if you wanted to tuck your loved one in after they lost the ability to speak. Leave me a voicemail and I'll play it. And that way your loved one can hear you if you're far away and you can't be there or you've decided, you've both decided, the person in you, that you've already said your goodbyes physically. And we did that. And as we got down to the last 48 hours, um, this lovely person started to show some signs of being a little bit agitated, which is normal. And Julie will have told you about that too if you're watching on, on her hospice channel. It's quite natural to go through in the death process, but it can be easily fixed most of the time um, by some medications. And I just needed to dial up the district nurse, get a little jab, you know, just an injection, not much at all. And that person calmed right down. They weren't drugged. Um, it wasn't like that. They were just soothed and their breathing went back to their normal breathing. And then in those last 48 hours, a lot of times the breathing will begin to change. And those are your first kind of signs um, that somebody is dying. They're going through the dying process. They don't speak. They are more still. Once you've got them calmed, not everybody gets anxious. Um, and a lot of times when I say anxious, I don't mean emotionally anxious. I mean, the body is agitated. 
um, because it's just doing things that the body does. You may be unconscious to some degree, but you know, I believe that people know when somebody is present by touch, by sound, by smell, just by that vibe, right? And we agreed on what I was going to do to make myself known. And we continued on with that. And I went through my first experience here in England and it was, it was beautiful. It was sometimes hard, sometimes emotional, sometimes frustrating because that's life and that's death. But at the very end, what I decided to do, because I was watching the clock and I was watching this loved one and I could see they were, they were calm. It was like they were ready to go. They talked everyone and I knew that they were ready to go, but their bodies were just kind of hanging out and I could see a little bit of discoloration, you know, your fingers might get, fingernails might be a bit purplish, your nose, your extremities, um, even though you've got blankets on you, your fingers might be a bit cold. And that's just because the body is starting to adjust and things, uh, organs are beginning to die off and little by little, but still you're comfortable, very comfortable in the lovely bed with the best pillows in the world and the most gentle voices around you with the most lovely scents and flavors to keep your mouth moist and your lips moist and your eyes and your face, your hands, anything that you need, anything. And I watch. And so I decided that I was going to take all the memories that this person gave me and I was going to construct a flight home. And that's what I did. And at about two in the morning, the day this person went home, I said, <laughs> I ran to the loo, to the bathroom real quick, <laughs> washed my hands, washed my face, got myself a cup of tea, shook myself out of it, got bright eyed and said, all right. And I, I took this person's hand and I said, buckle in we're going for a ride um, and I explained to this person that I'd gotten us tickets um, together and I was going to fly this person home I wasn't get to, get to stay because I had to come back it wasn't my time to go yet but I was able to get two tickets and I'd be able to take them to their doorstep and say goodbye to even be able to see their street because they really wanted to show it to me um, their, their visual street. And so I went through the whole thing. We were at the airport, you know, the, the, the taxi had taken us there. Uh, we'd gotten on the airplane and I asked, oh, I, I didn't ask. I knew what this person's favorite cocktail was. And I said, well, would you look at that? They're passing out the gin and tonic. <laughs> and so I said, well, so here's some for you. And I've got my soda water here. And I even kind of leaned my arm against their arm and my leg against their leg, even though they were in a hospital bed, I dropped the sides down and scooted in, took one of their hands. I said, isn't this a smooth flight? And wouldn't you know it, they're playing your favorite movie on their in-flight movie. And they had a favorite movie, which I won't say, because once again, we're gonna keep this anonymous. And all through the plane ride, the movie was playing, which I had on my laptop playing. And we also had the soundtrack to that movie on a playlist on a loop playing. And so it was so much. I say, look out the window. It's a blue sky day. We're going to get there in good time. You look beautiful. We've got everything packed. I've just got my quick overnighter and I've got everything you need. And I'm going to drop you off and we'll come visit you. You know, save me a place at your table and I'll come for dinner one night. And and your family members will all come visit you one by one in time. But for now, we're going to drop you off. And we did. We got there at the airport. We landed. And I said, would you just smell 
The air, it almost smells like those lemons you were telling me about in Italy, the lemon trees. It's beautiful. There's gardenias. There's birds in the air. There's seagulls. Must be close to the water. And um, we got in the cab to take this person home. And they were very relaxed. And I looked at their breathing and they were starting to change in their breathing. It was slowing down a little bit. Sometimes you didn't know when the next breath was going to come or if it would. Um, but I just stroked their, their lovely hair and held their hand and we sat together in the taxi and I talked all about the ride home. Look at these beautiful houses. Oh my gosh, one of these must be yours. Wow, you live in a nice neighborhood. Okay, here we're pulling up now. And by then it was about getting close to five in the morning and the sun was coming up and you, you could hear the seagulls in real life. And I said, well, gosh, the, the sun is starting to dawn. Now it's, it's, it's all coming to life. And here you are. I'm going to leave you right here. You are fully able. I know your legs weren't working too well before and you were out of breath, but you look brilliant now. I, I'd say you look like you're almost in your twenties or thirties. How was that? That's not even fair. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I see at your doorway, the door is open and there's a gentleman there waiting for you. Dark hair, quite handsome. And a cat. And he's had a baby in his arms. There's so many stories behind all of those, but I said, they're waiting for you. You can go to them and all of a sudden I felt just the tiniest movement from this person's leg. And I had not felt the move since way earlier in the day before. My days were running together. I was like, is this today or yesterday? Where am I? Because uh, I was so there with them. And when they did that, they also brought their hands up because they'd been here on their chest. And they started to bring their hands up a little bit. So I kind of just peeked under the covers and saw that color changes had definitely happened. Yeah, things were happening. And I said, okay, all right, we're home, we're home. Let me just get you comfortable. Let me make sure you have everything you need. There's your suitcase. You're gonna walk through the gate. And I just put my arm under their head and held on to their hand. And I said, thank you for letting me take you home. And now you're in a safe and beautiful place where we can all come and see you. And now it's up to you to take the next step. And with that, they took a deep breath, but not too much on the exhale. Another deep breath, you could see. And then I was waiting for that big exhale. But there wasn't one. There was only just a slight little whisper of one. And then they were just like a feather in my hands. And I laid this person back and I said, okay, well, aren't you clever to just tiptoe right out of this life into the next? all right so i fixed the bed i fixed the bed clothes put their arms down at their side brushed their hair wiped their face did all of those little things gave a kiss on the forehead and put on the soundtrack again and called a family member who asked to be called and then they would come with their spouse and they would take it from there and then I would call my husband and say, come get me. It's time to go home. 
And before I left, I asked if I could say goodbye, and I did. I, I gave one more kiss and said thank you for the honor, for such an honor, to let me walk you home. I was so touched, and then I was so lucky. It's something that we don't all get to do, but it was so peaceful and beautiful, and it was just what she wanted and just what we worked so hard together on. And I was so proud of her and her strength and courage to do this. And I knew she had truly released. She was away. She was gone. You know, she did it. And I was, I was amazed and dazed. <laughs> And I went home and it took me, it takes a couple weeks to get kind of back into your world if you want to know. Um, because gosh, you're in this other world before that and you really, I threw myself into it and was part of everything. Part of talking to the GPs, part of talking to the care team, part of talking to the family and part of talking to this loved one and, and just working it all out working it all out and putting myself out of it. Ego is a tough one. Oof. Taking your ego out of it because it's not for me. It's for them. And I always, when I went to sleep at night, those were the last thoughts that were in my head. It's not for me. It's for them. It's not for me. It's for them. And in between there, you know, when it was, I had moments I would sneak off and FaceTime my hubby real quick and let him know I was all right. We missed each other, but we knew we'd be together again and got to see Lola <laughs> and just touch base and do the things I needed to do. But in the meantime, I was there for that person 24 seven and I would do it again in a heartbeat and I will do it again. And it's the thing that I want to do and would love to do. It's not something that you can say is your 24 hour job because who knows who's going to call and when. It's something you kind of have to be available for, um, which is tricky when you also need to work. Um, but sometimes life finds a way and death finds a way. And there's so much more I want to share with you about this. There's so much more. And I want to know about your questions. Do you have any questions for me? I'd love to hear what questions you would have. Think about for yourself. Think about for your loved one. Think about some experiences you had where you thought it might be nice to have somebody there for you. I've taken care of people where... The main person I took care of wasn't the person who was dying, but it was one of their children, grown children, who needed that support. And I, I worked with both of them. We were like a, a trio there. And then the brothers and sisters as well, we were like a team. Um, so there's there's so many different ways that this can be done. But that's that's my story. That's my experience here in England. Um, that first experience here in England as an end of life doula. And um, thanks for listening to it. And um, I'd love to hear from you. I really would. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. And not everybody will agree with it. And that's okay. Like we're all supposed to have our own thoughts and feelings. Otherwise, why be a person, a unique person in this world, right? It would be boring, boring. So I'm going to say goodbye for now. And again, thank you so, so much for listening to this. And um, I'll talk to you again real soon. Sending love from T. Bye for now.